Hi guys, it is a blissfully cool and rainy night here. In the collapse of global industrial civilization, uh, where I am thrilled to say we are finally getting some rain in the drought parched bugs in a jar farm in the Finger Lakes of New York, baby. And it is Tuesday, June. 7th, 2022. So, uh, after that embarrassment, uh, was it just yesterday I was reading that embarrassing thing from uh, the New York Times with Ezra Klein in that whatever hopium he was spouting out. We're going to give the New York Times a chance to redeem themselves here in the uh, doomosphere and uh, we're going to follow the New York Times over to the great state of Utah. Is it still called the Beehive State? I, I think Utah changed its name from the Beehive State to the right the right place to live, you know, meaning the politically right place to live, but we're going to go over to a place I've been to several times, and that is the Great Salt Lake in Utah, or what's left of the Great Salt Lake, as the New York Times, a classic chronicle of the collapse here today, uh, the second biggest story on planet Earth, according to Yahoo News. The collapse of the Great Salt Lake. So we're going to do a little microcosm of the rest of the planet. Take it away, the New York Times. Some fellow named Christopher Flavel bringing us this piece. <clears throat> As the Great Salt Lake dries up, Utah faces an environmental nuclear bomb. There you go, the not-so-great Salt Lake. If the not-so-great Salt Lake, which is already shrunk by two-thirds, continues to dry up, which it will, here is what is in store. The lake's flies, well, I'm sure a lot of people will will uh, mourn the passing of the lake's flies. The lake's flies and brine shrimp, otherwise known as sea monkeys, would die off. Scientists warn it could start as soon as this summer, threatening the 10 million migratory birds that stop at the lake annually to feed on the tiny creatures. Ski conditions at the resorts above Salt Lake City, a vital source of revenue, would deteriorate. The lucrative extraction of magnesium and other minerals from the lake could stop. I'm a little bit unclear. It seems like it would only uh, ramp up, but anyway... Uh, we do have a bright spot. The lucrative extraction of minerals from the lake could stop. Most alarming, more alarming than 10 million birds starving to death, the air surrounding Salt Lake City would occasionally turn poisonous. The lake bed contains high levels of arsenic and as more of it becomes exposed, windstorms carry that arsenic into the lungs of nearby residents who make up three quarters of Utah's population. This is Joel Ferry, a Republican. Would you look at the camera, please? Joel Ferry, a Republican state lawmaker and rancher who lives on the north side of the lake, quote, we have this potential environmental nuclear bomb 
that is going to go off if we don't take some pretty dramatic action. Of course, he does not say what the dramatic action is other than uh, fleeing Salt Lake City. And of course, as climate change continues to cause record-breaking drought, there are no easy solutions meaning there are no solutions at all. Saving the not-so-Great Salt Lake would require letting more snow melt from the mountains flow to the lake, which means less water for residents and farmers. That would threaten the region's breakneck, I love that word, breakneck population growth and high-value agriculture, something state leaders seem reluctant to do. <clears throat> Utah's dilemma raises a core question as the country heats up. How quickly are Americans willing to adapt to the effects of climate change even as those effects become urgent? obvious and potentially catastrophic. Uh, <clears throat> I think we all know the answer to how quickly are Americans willing to adapt to the effects of climate change. Uh, well, of course, I'm adapting by uh, putting in a new Grand Canyon out in my yard to divert the uh, flood waters away from my little house. The stakes are alarmingly high, according to Timothy D. Hawks, another Republican lawmaker who wants more aggressive action. Otherwise, he said, the Great Salt Lake risks the same fate as California's now former Owens Lake which went dry decades ago, producing the worst levels of dust pollution in the United States and helping to turn the nearby community into a veritable ghost town. Quote, It is not just fear-mongering, he said, of the lake vanishing. It can actually happen. Yes. Okay, so uh, then what they do is they, the New York, this is a long involved article, and uh, it goes into the hydrology of, uh, of the area around the Great Salt Lake. Uh, just shy of Wyoming, you would find a modern oasis, a narrow strip of green, you know, in the middle of an otherwise desert, stretching some 100 miles from north to south, home to an uninterrupted metropolis beneath snow-capped mountains sheltered under maple and pear trees. Yes, at the edge of that oasis between the city and the desert is the Great Salt Lake. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, the area, I'm condensing this, uh, the metro area, the metro Salt Lake City area is one of the fastest growing urban areas in America now home to two and a half million people drawn by the natural beauty and relatively modest cost of living there. Then that mega city, I'm not sure I'm ready to call Salt Lake City a mega city, is possible because of you know the hydrology of the area where you have, uh, so what you have and you can see this all over the planet, not just in Salt Lake City, Utah, is okay. You have <clears throat> snow falling in the mountains, okay, 
and the snow feeds the rivers, three rivers in this case, which provide water for the cities and towns, you know, at the base of the mountains, as well as the rich cropland nearby before flowing into the Great Salt Lake. Yes, until recently that hydrological system existed in a delicate balance. In summer, evaporation would cause the lake to drop about two feet, and then in spring, as the snowpack, you know, whatever's left of the snowpack melted, the rivers would replenish the lake. Now, two changes are throwing that system out of balance. And again, guys, this is not isolated to Salt Lake City, Utah. You see this pattern repeating over and over and over again. Lima, Peru, uh, all those cities, uh, you know, down below the Himalayan mountains. Uh, I could go on and on. The Andes, the Himalayas, the Rocky Mountains, the Sierra, you know, wherever there's mountains with snow on them and rivers coming out of them to uh, give people water. Yes, now two changes are throwing that system out of balance. Yes, one is explosive population growth. Yes, the same population growth that Ezra Klein was cheering on in the New York Times yesterday. This is one more reason not to have children. Okay, thank you, New York Times, for redeeming yourself. Okay, what is throwing the system out of balance? One is explosive population growth which is diverting more water from the rivers before they reach the lake. And the other shift is climate change, according to Robert Gillies, a professor at Utah State University. And Utah's state climatologist, higher temperatures cause more snowpack to transform to water vapor, which then escapes into the atmosphere rather than turning to liquid and running into rivers. More heat also means greater demand for water for lawns or crops, further reducing the amount that reaches the lake. And a shrinking lake means less snow. As storms pass over the Great Salt Lake, they absorb some of its moisture, which then falls as snow in the mountains. A vanishing lake endangers that pattern, said Gillies. If you don't have water, you don't have industry. You don't have agriculture. You don't have life. And of course, uh, where this is happening on an even bigger scale is in the Amazon rainforest what they're talking about here. Uh, I'm not going to get all involved in the hydrological cycle. This very same collapse that is unfolding in the Great Salt Lake is also beginning to take place in the Amazon rainforest where it is the forest that feeds the snowpack of the, it's the moisture from the forest that feeds the snowpack in the Andes that waters the forest. This whole chain, this whole water chain is being uh, completely thrown out of balance uh, by humans. Uh, explosive population growth and climate change are not two issues. Climate change is a result of explosive population growth. Okay, these are not two issues, number one and number two. 
the issue is population. Okay, population is number one. One A is the climate change being caused by too many people. So I hate to correct the New York Times. I guess I need to be an editor at the New York Times to explain this basic fundamental concept to the clueless morons at the New York Times who don't get it. Anyway, getting back to the New York Times. Okay. Last summer, meaning the summer of 2021, I assume, the water level in the Great Salt Lake reached its lowest point ever on record, as I was talking about last year, and it is likely to fall further this year. The lake's surface area, which used to cover about 3,300 square miles back in the late 1980s, has since shrunk to less than 1,000, according to the U.S. Geological Survey. So two-thirds of the lake is already gone, and take a wild guess. What that means is the salt content in the part of the lake closest to Salt Lake City used to fluctuate between 9 and 12 percent, according to Bonnie Baxter, a biology professor at Westminster College. But as the water level in the lake drops, its salt content has increased. If it reaches 17%, right now it is at 16%. If it reaches 17%, something Baxter says will happen this summer. The algae, which in this case is the good algae in the water, will struggle threatening the brine shrimp that consume it. While the ecosystem has not collapsed yet, Baxter said, quote, we are at the precipice. It's terrifying, close quote. The long-term risks are even worse one morning in March, Kevin Perry, a professor of atmospheric sciences at the University of Utah, walked out onto land that used to be underwater. He picked at the earth the color of dried mud like a beach whose tide went out and never came back. The soil, you know, the soil left behind, you know, from the retreating uh, water contains arsenic, antimony, copper, zirconium, and other dangerous heavy metals, much of it residue from mining activity in the region. Wow. Most of the exposed soil is now protected by a hard crust. But as wind erodes the crust over time, those contaminants become airborne. Clouds of dust make it difficult for people to breathe, particularly those with asthma or other respiratory ailments. Yes. Quote, quoting Dr. Perry, this is a disaster and the consequences for the ecosystem are absolutely, insanely bad. So, Salt Lake City is now running out of water, but growing fast. In theory, the fix is simple. Let more water from melting snowpack reach the lake by sending less water towards homes, businesses, and farms, but metropolitan Salt Lake City has barely enough water to support its current population, and it is expected to grow almost 50% by 2060. 
Obviously, these are not uh, believers in near-term human extinction. That there's two and a half million people there now, so there's going to be, what, 3.75 million people uh, down the line, and they already don't have the number. The, the lake is already down two-thirds, and they're going to increase the population by 50%. Do the math. So anyway, uh, demand for water in Salt Lake City could exceed supply around 2040. Yes. So anyway, then it goes through all of this uh, techno-utopian uh, BS talking about how Salt Lake City is going to turn this around probably by charging a lot more for water. Uh, then they tell the story of how these homeowner associations that if you try to stop watering your lawn, uh, that you will be fined by your homeowners association. Uh, <laughs> anyway, but anyway, let's move through all of that um, about all the ways they're not going to fix this problem. So, let's look at what the future may hold and anyone who has seen Chinatown, who has seen the movie Chinatown, probably knows a little bit about this story. What the future, you know, of the not so great lake might hold. The worst case scenario for the not so great Salt Lake is neither hypothetical nor abstract. Rather, it is on display 600 miles southwest in a narrow valley at the edge of California where what used to be a lake is now a barely contained disaster. As we learned in the movie Chinatown in the early 1900s, Los Angeles, growing fast and running out of water, bought land along either side of the Owens River, then built an aqueduct diverting the river's water 230 miles south to LA. The river had been the main source of water for what was once Owens Lake, which at one time covered more than 100 square miles. So then of course, LA stole the water, the lake dried up, and for much of the 20th century, the former Owens Lake was the worst source of dust pollution in America, according to a 2020 study by the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. When windstorms hit the dried lake bed, they kick up what's called PM10, particular matter 10 micrometers or smaller, which can lodge in the lungs when inhaled and has been linked to worsen asthma, heart attacks, and premier, premature death. The amount of this stuff in the air around Owens Lake has been as much as 138 times higher than deemed safe by the EPA. Local officials successfully sued Los Angeles, arguing the city had violated the rights of nearby communities to clean air. A judge ordered LA to reduce the dust. That was 25 years ago. Since then, Los Angeles has spent two and a half billion dollars trying to keep wind from blowing dust off the former lake bed. Now, of course, 
Uh, we're not talking a lake right next to two and a half million people. We're talking to a former lake out in the middle of nowhere for I think it says like 50 people, but this time it's going to be a lake right next to two and a half million people when uh, the not so great Salt Lake goes the way of Owens Lake. The city, meaning L.A., 230 miles uh, downstream, has tried different strategies. Covering the lake bed in gravel, spraying just enough water on the dust to hold it in place, constantly tilling the dry earth, creating low ridges to catch rest of dust particles before they can become airborne, it sounds increasingly uh, hopeless. The result, you know, of all of that techno-utopian uh, apocalyptimism, the result of all of that is a mix between an industrial site and a science experiment. On a recent morning, workers scurried across the vast area checking valves and sprinklers that continually get plugged with sand. Yes. <clears throat> uh, good Lord. Uh, dust levels near the, you know, former lake uh, sometimes exceed federal safety rules. Um, among Utah's coterie of nervous advocates for the not-so-Great Salt Lake, Owens Lake has become shorthand for the risks of failing to act quickly enough and the grave damage if the lake dries up, the contents of its bed spinning into the air. Yes, on what used to be the shore of what used to be Owens Lake is what's left of the town of Keeler. When the lake still existed, Keeler was a boom town. Keeler was a boom town. Today, the town of Keeler and tomorrow, the town of the Great Salt Lake consist of an abandoned Mormon tabernacle, that, that's not really a joke, we're talking about Keeler, California, today consists of an abandoned school, an abandoned train station, a long-closed general store, a post office that is open from 10 a.m. to noon, and about 50 remaining residents who value their space and now have lots of it. Cheap land, said Jim Macy when asked why he moved to Keeler in 1980. Yes, he described that period before L.A. began trying to hold down the lake bed as, quote, the time of dust. He recalled watching entire houses vanish from sight when the, bl when the wind blew in, as Macy said, quote, we called it the Keeler Death Cloud. The Keeler Death Cloud now becoming the not-so-Great Salt Lake Death Cloud. As, uh, you know, guys, it never ends. This is one more story about too many people screwing up the environment, and maybe we shall see abandoning the, uh, the city of two and a half million people can go somewhere else. Uh, to build their Mormon tabernacle. Don't get me going on that rant.
Anyway, uh, the little dog says it is bedtime and it is time to head to the tiny house. So we're going to go out and enjoy listening to the rain beating on the roof and the frogs croaking in the pond. And I highly suggest, especially if you live in Salt Lake City, to enjoy the croaking of the frogs or the, uh, the brine shrimp croak while you still can. Bye, guys. Yes, a little nervous, Nelly. You have been nervous at all rent. Zip up, it's bedtime. Bye, guys. Good little dog. Are you ready to go to bed or what?